Hi everyone, I'm Nino Isakadze, second year cardiology fellow at Johns Hopkins. I'm very excited to talk to you about the QT interval today. So we'll, we'll start from the very basics. So the QT interval is defined as the interval from the onset of the QRS complex that is the earliest indication of ventricular depolarization to the end of T wave that is the latest indication of the ventricular repolarization. As you know, many factors, including genetic mutations, medications, electrolyte levels, can influence ventricular repolarization and thus QT interval through effects on the ion channels and ion currents. QT interval shortens at faster heart rate and lengthens at the lower heart rate. Normal cardiac repolarization adapts to the heart rate to ensure that with the increasing heart rate, the myocardium is completely repolarized before the next depolarization wave enters. This prevents incomplete repolarization and subsequent possibility of the re-entrant tachycardium. Because of the change of the QT interval with the heart rate, we correct it for heart rate and call it QTC. So QTC is prolonged if it is more than 450 milliseconds in males and if it's more than 460 milliseconds in females. So why should we care? So QTC prolongation is associated with the life-threatening arrhythmia, um, ventricular arrhythmia called torsastepon. And the data from patients who are on the QTC prolonging medications and genetically prolonged QTC suggests that if the QTC is more than 500 milliseconds, it's associated with a two to three-fold higher risk of this arrhythmia. And this is especially relevant now when we're on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic and are widely using medications that have possibility of prolonging the QT interval, such as azithromycin, hydroxychloroquine, lopinavir, ritinavir. So in the next few slides, I'm going to walk you through how to manually measure the QT interval and calculate the QTC. So you may say that, why do we need to manually do that when we have automated QTC measured and available on the EKGs that we print out. So large studies have shown the sensitivity of the automated ECG algorithms below 50% for detecting prolonged QT intervals. It is unreliable when the T wave morphology is abnormal, there is prominent U waves, there is complex TU morphology, as well as the extremes of the heart rate. It is also important to note that the data shows that manual assessment of the QT interval, even of rather straightforward ECGs, appears to be difficult for many physicians worldwide. So it may be useful to go through the next um, steps, how to evaluate the QT interval. So step number one is to identify the lead where you want to measure your QT interval. So leads two or V5, V6 are usually the best options for a measurement. The vector axis of the P, QRS, and TU wave is predominantly directed infralaterally and thus in the direction of lead 2. This often results in more clearly defined P, QRS, T, and U waves in lead 2, which promote their measurement. In addition, the reference values are also determined for lead 2. If you don't see well-defined T wave in these leads, select the lead where the T wave is clearly visualized. Step number two is to identify the onset of the QRS and the end of the T wave. Identification of the onset of QRS is a pretty easy task usually, but identification of the end of the T wave can get tricky. Especially when the T wave has flattening towards its end, is biphasic, notched, or has superimposed U wave. For this reason, several authors have supported the use of tangent technique. So you draw a line for a baseline at the level of the TP interval, and then draw another line from the peak of the T wave following the steepest T wave downslope. The intersection of this line with the isoelectric baseline is considered the end of the T wave. A few important points here. So if you notice the U wave that is more than one millimeters and is fused to the T wave, you need to include it in the measurement of the QT interval. But if the U wave is small, less than one millimeters, and is not fused with the T wave, then it should be excluded from the QT measurement. Step number three is pretty easy. So now that you have identified the onset of the QRS and the end of the T wave, you can calculate the interval between those two points. And it's important to note that 
remind you that small box is 40 milliseconds and half box is 20 milliseconds. So now it's time to correct the QT interval for the heart rate. And there are numerous formulas to do this. The most widely used is a formula derived by Bizet in 1920. This adjustment procedure divides the measured QT by the square root of the error interval to derive the rate adjusted value. And many 12 ABCG laboratories use Bizet's per formula to derive the QTC interval. Bizet's formula overestimates QTC with a higher heart rate and underestimates QTC with a lower heart rate. It works best when used with the heart rates between 60 and 100. Interestingly, in the same year, Friedricha suggested that this relationship was a function of the cube root of the error interval in the small sample of the ECGs. And this formula is actually now a standard for the FDA while evaluating medications for the effect of the QT interval. This formula also tends to overestimate QTC with the higher heart rates. Framingham and Hodges formulas are less affected by the abnormal heart rate, uh, but they are still not as widely used as the Bizet and Friedericia formulas. Of course, you don't have to memorize those formulas, but good news is that there are multiple online QTC calculators you can find with the quick search. So you can input the QT interval that you measured and the heart rate, and you're going to get the calculated QTCs with multiple different formulas. Um, so if you have uh, heart rate that's in the normal range, you can use Bizet's or Friedrichia um, formulas. And if the higher trade is on the higher side, you may choose to use Framingham and um, Hodges uh, formulas. It is also important to be very consistent um, when you're monitoring the same patient for the interval change of the QTC. Be sure to use the same recording device same ECG lead to measure the QT and the same heart rate correcting formula. How do we measure the QT interval during the wide left bundle branch block or the paced rhythm? So we know that conduction delay is often associated with a lengthening of the QT interval. So Bogassi and Uncle and colleagues showed that QT prolongation caused by left bundle branch block constitutes 48.5 so nearly 50% of the QRS width. And in the Bugassian formula, the QRS duration is divided in half, and this value is subtracted from the measured QT. So this is a formula that you can use in your patients who have left bundle branch block or are RV paste. So how do we measure the QT interval and calculate QTC in the setting of atrial fibrillation? So answer to that question is that we don't really know. That's why there are so many words on this slide. There is no real good strategy on how to measure the QT interval, and we also don't have the ideal formula to calculate the QTC. So the most accurate way to estimate the QT is to manually measure five different QT intervals, five different RR intervals, and average um, them out. So this may not be so practical, especially if we have to do this for multiple patients on a daily basis. And the second best but less accurate is to manually uh, measure the QT and the RR interval for the longest and the shortest beats and then average them as well. And the problem is also that we don't have the best QTC calculator um, in the sending of atrial fibrillation and all formulas perform um, less accurately than in the sending of the sinus rhythm. And especially if the heart rates are higher, um, higher than 110, um, they perform even more, um, you know, even worse. Um, so Bizet's and Hodge's correction formula is overestimating the QTC, um, and Framing and Fredericia are underestimating QTC in this setting. And one practical solution for this could be that we take a look at the rhythm strip and see whether on average the QT interval is more than half of the RR interval. And obviously, this doesn't give us the exact number of the QTC, but it will give us a signal that the actual QTC could be longer than critical threshold of 500 milliseconds, and we take action. So if you see torsades on the monitor, uh, certainly first um, go resuscitate patient, but uh, give us a call. Uh, we're more than happy to help anytime. 
Thank you for your attention. It was a pleasure talking to you today.